and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the CALB Report, a public policy forum co-sponsored by the George Washington University, the National Press Club, and the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I'm Marvin Kalb, a senior fellow at the Shorenstein Center. Our program is being carried live by XM Satellite Radio and WMAL here in Washington, and is being taped for later use by PBS Channel 32 and Bloomberg News. We are funded by the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. At a time when journalism is in trouble, its credibility questioned, and ratings and circulation dropping, we've been asking in these forums two questions. What is journalism? and who is a journalist. There is no question that our guest tonight is a journalist. And what she's been practicing for the past 28 years at the New York Times is journalism. So why is Judith Miller in the center of a roiling controversy about journalism? About how good reporters deal with unnamed government officials, how they deal with their own newspapers or networks, about differing definitions of ethics, ultimately about whether the story of this reporter is going to end up helping or hurting the cause of good journalism. Judith Miller joined the Times in 1977, left the Times last week. She's been bureau chief in Cairo and in Paris, and she has spent a good deal of time in the Middle East covering the rise of Al-Qaeda and terrorism. And somehow she's also found the time to write or co-author four books, one on the Holocaust, another on Saddam Hussein's Iraq, a third on Islamic extremism, and in 2001, a bestseller called Germs, written with two of her Times colleagues. She's won a Pulitzer, an Emmy, a DuPont, and most recently, the First Amendment Award given by the Society of Professional Journalists. Earlier this year, Judy Miller spent 85 days in jail to protect the identity of a source. That's twice as long as any other reporter has ever spent in jail to protect a source. Before I ask my first question, I want to go on record as saying that anyone who claims that Judy Miller deliberately went to jail to burnish her image or to improve her reputation as a journalist is clearly someone who has never spent any time in jail. And that's probably too polite. Anyone who says that is crazy. So welcome, Judy Miller. Thank you, Marvin. When you did go to jail, <laughs> when you did go to jail, Judy, you were seen as a hero in the world of journalism. Now you are seen as a woman of mass destruction, to quote your former colleague Maureen Dowd, a reporter who misled her editor, who didn't get on with her colleagues, who big-footed her way from one interview or briefing to another. So my question is, how did you travel in this brief period of time from being this heroine to being a villain? That's an excellent question. <laughs> how, did, how, did, how did it happen? Well, I, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, I think you know the, exagger the uh, stories of my heroism were exaggerated, <laughs> <laughs> and the stories of, uh, uh, that followed were obviously exaggerated, in a lot of cases totally untrue, uh, some of which have been retracted now uh, by the New York Times. and. Um, I think that something that happened is uh, that I became uh, a symbol of the fury over the public debate, public questioning about the war, about this administration, about WMD reporting, about unhappiness with a great many things in our society. and. Uh, People were looking for explanations and for easy people to blame, and uh, <laughs> you were there. here I was. And, and I think it was somewhat easier to vilify me because I had been elevated in the press as this, to this heroic standard, which I, I, I never thought of myself as heroic. Um, I was uh, terrified to go to jail. I was extremely unhappy in jail, but I really don't believe in whining. 
and uh, complaining, uh, except to editors about stories that are cut or mangled or you know, not enough space or not good play or the picture is terrible or all the usual things that journalists complain about. But nothing quite prepares you for going to jail. And, uh, and it, was, it was difficult but not nearly as difficult as the period coming out when the very reasons for my going to jail were called into question. Uh, a great many assertions were made that were completely unfounded. Uh, a great many f uh, alleged facts uh, appeared in print that were not checked and were not true and could have been checked. And it was a very difficult and painful period. And I think now things are beginning to kind of even out and I'm um, I feel uh, greatly liberated by having left the, the great convent of the New York Times, a, a great institution, but uh, it was clearly time to leave. Yeah. Has this experience uh, changed your judgment about journalism? No, it, it's made me ask a lot of questions about journalism. I mean, I never doubted for a moment once I got into this profession, as I'm sure you didn't, uh, that this was a wonderful profession to be in. I mean, it, it's not one you should enter thinking you're going to make money or that you're going to have any job security, though I've had quite a lot of job security um, until recently. And I, I think, but it is one for people who want to make a difference. Uh, I came from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Um, way back in the Pleistocene in at, 19, Princeton. at Princeton in 1972. And when I told uh, the people at Woody Wilson that I wanted to be a journalist, they said, but that's not really public affairs. That's not public service. I think what's happened in the you know, 30 years is that people have begun to realize that journalism is about public affairs. It's about the public's right to know and informing the public. But the way in which that's happening is changing so quickly now. And the internet the and the, the I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not, I think this episode raises some questions about what's happening in our profession. Uh, things appear on blogs that are picked up in the MSM, and a term I did not know <laughs> before I went to jail, uh, mainstream media. Uh, they are picked up on the blogs. They are first put out as theories or gossip, and they quickly become printed, published, broadcast fact, even if they happen to be completely untrue. Mm. And our, our business is changing. We are, as you said, under tremendous pressure. Papers are shrinking. The circulations are shrinking. Advertising is shrinking. Readers are dying, <laughs> literally <laughs> dying off. Um, it opens, there's a whole new world opening up, a whole new way of transmitting information in blogs, but I'm not sure what the impact is on the quality of journalism and what Americans are going to know. Are we going to be better informed or less well informed because of this explosion of media? I what mostly have questions. You well, in the beginning, there's always a kind of, um, there's a firestorm, and we, don't, we really don't know. We're kind mm. of in the middle of that. I, I, I hope that bloggers eventually will come to adopt some of the standards of mainstream media. I hope mainstream media becomes a little more adventuresome, adventurous. Uh, I hope for a kind of sorting out. But at the moment, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's chaotic out there. And it's also, I think, think not a terrific service to the public. And in some ways it is, and in some ways it isn't. And you've been uh, very gracious in your comments about the New York Times, but now it's just the two of us. Could you tell us, <laughs> <laughs> could you tell us what this experience has meant to your judgment of the newspaper to which you devoted 28 years? Well, Joe Lelyveld, who was a great executive editor, once said to me when this WMD criticism was beginning, he said, you know, this is actually good, Judy, because every reporter ought to know what it's like to be unfairly criticized in the press. <laughs> <laughs> and I often thought of that as time went on <laughs> and this kind of, um, once again, firestorm built up over my reporting and other reports about WMD. Uh, I think 
you know, I've, I've clearly learned a lot from it, but I think I was very surprised and obviously disappointed by the papers, uh, what the Newsweek called the, the war, war on Miller. Uh, and I was particularly taken back because I had never considered myself at war with my paper. And I was shocked by uh, the message to the staff and all of the things, uh, Maureen's column, and all of the things that happened. I'd had no advance warning. No one ever told me they were unhappy. It just kind of came out of the blue. On Wednesday, I was testifying on behalf of the New York Times as an individual, but still as a New York Times reporter for a federal shield law. Mm -hmm. And two days later, the message to the staff that Mr. Keller wrote circulated on email, and I opened up my email like everyone else and read it, and uh, no one ever informed me that it was coming. So, but you know, it was a very painful and difficult moment. On the other hand, the paper has, uh, Mr. Keller has now clarified his remarks. Uh, I might use the word apologized. Uh, the uh, allegation that I misled an editor has been withdrawn, uh, and tempers have cooled, and I have nothing but uh, admiration for the institution of the Times. I will always think it's one of the great papers in this country, and I leave with no regrets and hoping that the Times maintains its extraordinary standards of journalism. Is it possible, Judy, that the, that the fact that there was so little time between your defense up on Capitol Hill of a federal shield law and Keller's email to the entire staff, which did contain certain unflattering implications, that that, was, that, that, that concealed a welling up of resentment and unhappiness about you that might have been sitting there for a, a period of time. Oh, yes, I think that's think true. That, yeah, of course. That, you know, the, this all played on itself. And, and the, in this, the bloggers also played a tremendous role. Accelerated the process. Mm -hmm, accelerated the process. But, uh, you know, it, it, there, are, there are moments in every institution where institutions don't do the right thing by, by people. It happens in great networks. It happens in great newspapers. And when it happens, it's painful. But, you, it, you, you know, you move on. And I had long felt a desire to want to express opinions that I was unable to express in the Times. And I believe firmly that reporters, though they may be motivated by a point of view, should try and be as straight as possible in print. Uh, so it was, it was getting to be time to move on. And once I became the news, once I became the lightning rod, that really made it impossible for me to continue at a paper like the Times, because no New York Times reporter wants to be or should be the news. It just shouldn't happen. Tell me, uh, we'll get back to this uh, later, but how did you get into this business? Ah, because I was a failed economics student. <laughs> I was at the Woodrow Wilson School thinking of some kind of public service. And I, was, uh, I had economics as, as a major. I was a graduate student doing work on a master's. And I looked forward to a life at the World Bank or an <laughs> NGO or you know, government service, which is what Woodrow Wilson trained uh, students for. And the Woodrow Wilson School sent me to Israel in the summer of 1971 to do a, uh, a, a paper on uh, building housing, the economics of building housing on occupied Arab land. Mm. And I had never set foot in the Middle East. I'd had no interest, uh, particular interest in it. But there was so much that I wanted to say that I couldn't put in this paper <laughs> on <laughs> occupied housing in occupied land that I began writing some freelance articles. And then I began to see journalism as a way of having an impact on the way people thought about problems. Was it any one person who kind of turned you toward journalism, inspired you? Well, one person whom I was very friendly with at the time, um, there were a couple. Uh, Dan Greenberg, who was the editor of mm -hmm. Science and Government Report and had been an editor of sci a news editor of Science Magazine, was a <laughs> phenomenal journalist and very funny and uh, kind of 
eased the transition for me, said, yes, you, you can try this. See what you, you think. And Larry Stern, also, who was at the Washington Post, mm -hmm. who created the style <coughs> section, uh, who was a great investigative reporter and editor, and who brought many young uh, people along at the Post and was widely admired. I also was very friendly with him. And they encouraged me. And then, of course, it was the era of Woodward and Bernstein. You know, I came to Washington 72. Watergate was taking off, and it was a, you know, it was a great story, and journalists were heroes, and it was nice to be thought of as part of a heroic profession. And it was exciting. It was a very easy time to be here, though not particularly for women, but it, it, was, uh, it was exciting. And uh, I never looked back. I just, you could come and-, and How did you get your here. first break? Mm, first break, um, probably those pushy elbows you've heard about. <laughs> I think I went, I, I was freelancing for uh, WBAI. I had done some radio reports for them in New York, and when I went down to Washington, I joined their Washington Bureau, and eventually somebody went on to a real job with real work and real paycheck, <laughs> and I got that job. And then I became Erwin Knoll, who was the editor of the Progressive Magazine, which was a left-of-center publication from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he, went, he became the editor of the Progressive and moved to Madison, which is a place that people, Californians like me, only we shudder just to think about Madison, Wisconsin in winter. But I happily was going to be in the Washington Bureau, so I became the Washington Bureau chief. In fact, I was the entire Washington Bureau. <laughs> there were no reporters, stringers. The Washington Bureau was in my collective house, and that's how I started. And then I just freelanced like crazy. and. Um, eventually got hired by the New York Times thanks to affirmative action. How did that work out? The women of the New York Times sued the New York Times for discrimination, and the paper was desperately looking for, quote, qualified women. I was not qualified at the time, but they decided, decided to hire me anyway. I had never worked for a daily newspaper. I got a job. Had, had you applied for the job? No, I was solicited. Um, uh, uh, John Finney who, the late John Finney, who was a, a great, legendary Pentagon reporter Absolutely. and editor at the, at the New York Times Washington Bureau, took me out to lunch and said, uh, I'm looking for qualified women. And I said, <laughs> I've never worked for a newspaper. He said, I know, I know. He said, pipe, tapping his pipe, but we'll try you anyway. So I, I, he said, will you cover anything? And I said, I'll cover anything at the New York Times. Uh, and up until recent <laughs> months, you really weren't looking back. I mean, you sort of went from one, from one terrific to assignment another. to another. Well, I don't know if the SEC was star started out as a terrific assignment, but it be rapidly became one because of uh, Bert Lance. Ah. The Securities and Exchange Commission was the place that was doing part of the investigation into, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, troubled secretary uh, and. Uh, it, it, it was a great story and an investigative one, and I got to work with some extraordinary people in the Times Washington Bureau. Was Judy, tell us about your interest in the Middle East. Um, you told us about going over there as mm -hmm. a student and writing your paper. Um, but as a journalist, um, what was your first immersion in Middle Eastern affairs? When did that happen? Under what circumstances? It actually happened um, in that summer. When I was over there, I um, and in uh, uh, the subsequent summer when I went back, um, I, at that point I had started to freelance for National Public Radio. Yes, with this voice, <laughs> it was not authoritative. I was terrible on tape, awful. I popped my peas. I had a sibilant s. I knew I was always going to be a disaster in broadcasting, but I loved schlepping you know, this huge, at that point, huge tape recorder around with the, the large microphone that you would shove in someone's face. And I um, had the chutzpah, I don't know, there is no Arabic word for chutzpah, by the way, <laughs> to uh, go to Jordan and say I wanted to see King Hussein. And much to my surprise, he saw me and we kind of hit it off and I did several interviews with him and several reports from Jordan and, and got very interested in subjects which were then not 
kind of hot topics like the growth of the right-wing settler movement in Israel. Uh, I, I saw this as very problematic from the beginning. And I, so I started to develop contacts and sources. And you know, if you go back to a place in a region again and again and again, you just keep showing up like a bad penny. Eventually, they get kind of used to seeing you. And over 20 years or so, you'll develop some contacts. But I, I was religious. I was relentless about going back, about following the news. Um, I never did very much about my pathetic Arabic. It just never <laughs> seemed to get any better. Um, but I had a burning passion about the region and a conviction from the beginning that somehow the fate of our country was going to be inexorably tied to developments in that region. Because of oil? Not just because of oil, because of history, because of Judeo-Christian culture, because of uh, Islam, which then nobody was talking about in the early 70s, very few people, um, because of, of history, tradition, uh, immigration. You could begin to say, see things happen e even then to Europe, especially. Um, and I, I just felt that this was a region that Americans knew all too little about and that wasn't being very well covered I mean, because uh, yes, people would rush in when there was a riot on the West Bank or when something, an, an event, right. an assassination, but, right. but in general, the underlying <clears throat> trends weren't being well covered, so I wanted to write about those. When was the first time you went to Iraq? Oh, 1976, and my luggage was stolen. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was part of a congressional delegation, and that got my attention. Because, you know, in most countries, when you travel with senators, as part of a, an entourage, your luggage doesn't get stolen. The secret police ensure that someone else's bags get stolen. But mine, wa uh, mine were. So the next stage of the trip was um, Saudi Arabia. And I remember that the king's tailor had to make me something <laughs> to wear because I couldn't wear the uh, jeans that I had on in Saudi Arabia. I uh -huh. had to wear something more suitable for a woman. Even traveling with senators, it was uh, Jim Aberesk, Senator Aberesk, and uh, I think George McGovern was on that trip. Uh, and it was a, it was a fascinating trip. But Iraq, even then, was a very. I mean, I remember being impressed by the enormous discipline of the Iraqis, by uh, Saddam Hussein, who was then a kind of young and up and coming uh, Iraqi politician. Did you meet him? No. I did. I did not ever meet him or interview him. He did not like journalists even then. But I kept going back to Iraq um, year after year. It was wealthy. It had an educated population. It, fancies it fancied itself the center of the Arab world, though every country in the Arab world thinks of itself as the center of the Arab world. But this is one that really was, historically, culturally, economically. So Did I read right important. that you had been jailed? Yeah, I was thrown in jail for a day. For a day. For a day, yes. Uh, that was my la on my last trip. Um, I, <laughs> uh, yes, that was not a good trip. <laughs> what I, was this? Um, was gosh, it must. It was during the Iran Iraq War. I had rushed out to take pictures and to see uh, a, a, a perhaps what was a Scud missile had landed quite close to where I was having lunch, an embassy where I, uh, where I was having lunch. And at that point, there was a burning question in American intelligence. Did Iran have Scud C missiles? And here one had landed kind of at my doorstep. So I abandoned my, my curry, uh, curry lunch, and the diplomat and I went racing out with another journalist named David Blundy, who was subsequently, he was later killed in El Salvador. And, uh, and Blundy and I were taking pictures and, and uh, running around the site. And you know, who knew what a Scud C hole looked like? I mean, I wouldn't have known a missile from, <laughs> from a rocket from a. But uh, the taking of pictures was illegal. And so uh, fortunately, the diplomat took our cameras, and I was only left with a camera that had very benign pictures of a state sponsored tour to the front. And that's what made it, uh, that's what enabled me to get out of jail. But it was, it was, uh, it was frightening because you, you know, you, 
you don't exactly get a call to your lawyer in an Iraqi <laughs> jail, even if you're an American journalist. And, and at that point, I smoked a great deal, like most of the Middle Eastern press corps. And we ran out of the c cigarettes about uh, halfway through my stay in jail. And at one point, David Blundy pushed me against the, the bars and said, he didn't speak Arabic, but he said, do you have cigarettes? Take the woman. <laughs> uh, I said, thank you, David. I will get even with you. <laughs> and I did. When we went to the Sudan together on the next trip, I scheduled only breakfast meetings. And David Blundy hated breakfast. <laughs> so I got even. <laughs> Tell me, when did you develop a strong um, attitude toward Iraq, the Iraqi government, Saddam Hussein? Mm. When did that develop? Over time, uh -huh. <laughs> over time, it became very clear that there was no regime in the Middle East that I had covered as ruthless, as horrible, as terrifying as this one. Uh, the victims were mostly uh, Iraqis. But then, of course, there, no sooner did it, Saddam Hussein come to power in Iraq than he began a war. Uh, this one was with Iran, next door neighbor, thinking that the Iranians were weak because they just had their revolution and that he could easily take them over. That was a grave miscalculation, as was his miscalculation about uh, the first George Bush. Um, but you could just see a kind of ruthlessness and a fear. Um, the fear, I can't begin to tell you how frightened Iraqis were. It was the only country where I felt really guilty about showing up and trying to ask people questions because they would almost tremble because anything you did that wasn't, the minder was always there with you, you could get away, but you were usually watched by other people because there were about seven different intelligence services spying on you, spying on one another. <coughs> Then there was the use of chemical weapons against his own people after he started a war that killed a million people. Uh, the chemical weapons uh, was disregarded by the United States, the use of it, because at that point we were playing a kind of uh, very cynical game. And, and it just got worse and worse and worse, and no one was paying attention. I, I remember writing a front page, uh, a, a cover piece for the magazine on uh, on Halabja and the, and the uh, genocide campaign on fall. And Warren Hogue, who was then the editor of the magazine and is now the UN correspondent, said, I'm going to put this on the cover. I had gotten a hold of a, a cache of Iraqi defense documents that documented the genocide, the, the systematic slaughter of the Kurds in the north. And mm -hmm. I had traveled through the north, and I watch them begin to unearth graves, mass graves. And this, this stuff just stays with you. And the, you know, the Americans didn't seem to care, but Warren, much to his credit, kept kind of humoring me and putting this stuff on the, on the cover of the magazine, along with you know, the Hoover so Dam. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and I just became convinced over time that this was a terrible, terrible man. And a terrible, terrible, <laughs> a terrible, terrible man regime. and regime so that when the United States went to war to have regime change, the that was a change. Time? The first time? No, no. 91? The first time, no, no. That didn't happen then. But in the, in the war in 2003, um, that was a war that you supported then, because it, I never supported it in print. I never wrote a story. No, no, I don't mean story. that. I mean, given your attitude toward Iraq, the idea of getting rid of Saddam Hussein was definitely something that definitely appealed to me. Definitely appealed to you. <laughs> I thought how wonderful it would be for these people who were educated and had a strong middle class to be able to um, have a chance at decent government. So that the idea just decent government. <laughs> I understand. So that the idea that um, President Bush number two did something right in Iraq was something that you could feel sympathy for. Well, I'm glad Saddam Hussein is gone. I'm not sure what has been done will turn out to be right in Iraq. I don't know how it's going to turn out. But I, the action of getting rid of him was uh, something Getting that, rid of him was a good thing. That was a good but thing. But the issue is, did we have to do it in that way? Why wasn't it done in 91? I mean, the United States 
People frequently say, well, we didn't, we didn't want to go to Baghdad in 91, but in 1991, and I covered that war, uh, we didn't, the United States didn't have to go to Baghdad. All they had to do was to keep Saddam Hussein's helicopters out of the air and from flying and from systematically gunning down the Shiite protesters who had partly at American urging risen up to take over their country. Mm -hmm. And uh, cynically, very cynically, I think, uh, nothing was done because many of Iraq's Sunni Arab neighbors were so worried about the Shiite majority population of Iraq, oh, we don't want another Iran in the Middle East, that they were not unhappy, many of the neighbors, to see this man continue in power. And okay. I thought it was, it was very disappointing to me as, as, a, as an American, as somebody who you know, knew I would be going back to Iraq and covering more misery and more terror and more fear. Um, you have, on this issue of weapons of mass destruction, you have acknowledged already many, many times that your reporting on that question was faulty. Well, no, and not the reporting, that the intelligence was the faulty. The intelligence was Unfortunately, faulty. Unfortunately, it was accurate reports of faulty intelligence. Right. And what I would like to get at is that you are a very good reporter and experienced about issues in that part of the world. So how come it happened? In other words, how come you could get intelligence? You know, a journalist goes with the stuff in the head and the stuff in the belly. Mm -hmm. I've always had a feeling. Mm -hmm. And the intelligence must have seemed to you at that time to be right. What I'm wondering about is, did you then take the intelligence and run it past other people like al in Vienna and people who raised really serious questions about the validity of that kind of intelligence. Did you do that? Yes, I did. And, and what, what it's happened? It's interesting because people who talk about sources, you know, stories with anonymous sources, don't look at those stories because almost all of my stories were quoting individuals on the record. Um, I didn't, I tended not to write about nuclear topics. I was more focused on chemical and biological okay. weapons because right. I didn't believe Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapon. I didn't think that he was any place close to getting a nuclear weapon. So mm -hmm. I was less interested in that, um, paradoxically. But I, I, I was focused on biological and chemical weapons. And when I would get these reports, I would try and vet them, both with outside experts like David Albright or, or Gary Same. Well, I guess at that point, Gary was still in the government, but outside you know, the, the kind of weapons wonks. <laughs> and I would also try and run them by the United Nations. Uh, what did the inspectors think? Because they had much better information, oftentimes, than the US government. To, there was there was very little information, really hard information from Iraq. And so many, all of the stories that I ran were kind of vetted by these people and who oftentimes signed, you know, permitted me to talk, quote them on the record. But the, the impression that is left then is a very unfair one. Because well, I the think it's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the impression is that you were so eager to see the end of the Saddam Hussein regime that you went with the intelligence that was very comfortable to you. Oh, no, that's That sort of unfair. fit your pre-sense of what it is that would be good for Iraq. Oh, no. No, that's not the way uh, I did uh, my work. I, I think that I was predisposed to believe that he had weapons of mass destruction because, A, he had used them on his own people, right. and, B, he had lied about it consistently to the United Nations, and I had been covering his lies to the United Nations again and again. But had I gotten an indication that there was serious doubt about information about the intelligence, that would have been reflected in the sto my stories. And in the one- But you didn't get the series. No, well, in the one story that many people write about, which was the aluminum tube story, which I did with, uh, with Michael Gordon from my newspaper, uh, when I got, uh, we not only broke that story that the CIA actually were analyzing these tubes that they had gotten out of Jordan, 
Uh, we broke that story. And then when I got a uh, sense, I was told that they, you know, not so fast. There's a debate about the purpose of these tubes, whether or not they're for a nuclear program or for non-nuclear purposes. I wrote that too. Now, the second story did not appear on the front page, but I think as every journalism student in this room knows, reporters don't determine where their stories go. And the other thing is that the, the, the reference to the debate was lower down in the piece than I think I would have liked or it should have been. I would have changed that now. If I look back at my own reporting, I'd say I would have made the debate the lead. the lead. But the fact of the matter is both the existence of the tubes and the debate about the tubes first appeared in the New York Times. And you know, a year later, when, um, when the editor of the New York Times um, wrote an editor's note, I think in the spring of 2004. Bill Keller. Bill Keller wrote, he said that the paper should have, quote, reflected greater editorial and repertorial skepticism, which to me, as I read that, seemed to be an indirect way, though he didn't mention your name, an indirect way of criticizing you he for criti lacking mm -hmm. that kind of skepticism. He criticized the six people whose work was cited in, right. in those stories, and right. by, through that. And I objected to the editor's note, but I said nothing because I was a New York Times reporter, and, and I thought it was more important. Uh, rather than write apologies, what I wanted to do was go out and do the reporting that would tell people how was this intelligence wrong? Why was it wrong? You know, how did it get to us? Did we not do a good enough job, or was the intelligence distorted deliberately? Was it just flat out wrong? Were there bureaucratic wars? Were there defectors paid off by people to present this material? I wanted an in-depth series of stories about this. And the times when you went who did you go to on the Times to, to recommend I'd, this? I'd, I'd rather not talk about that, even though I'm this gone. But I can say I made my views known. <laughs> no, no, but, but, this, but Jill Abramson has been no, no, quoted. No, no, well, this that's only on one story. On one story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, but it okay. was a paper decision. And you know, the problem with an editor's note, in general, is that it tends to blame the reporters, or it tends to blame unnamed editors for institutional failures. But I, what I think journalism is about is it's the first take of history. So if you get it wrong the first time, you go out and you do it again, and you do it again, and you get more information and more information until you come to an approximation of the truth. That's, we're never going to get it perfectly. We're always going to get things wrong. But the more you dig and the more you, you uh, try and, and find out why you made mistakes, the better off you're going to be and your readers are going to be. And that's what, well, that's what I think should have right. happened. And it and didn't happen in almost any newspaper in this country. There are very it's few, I can't think of a newspaper that said, OK, I'm now going to put together a team of people and we are going to go out and we are going to tell the American people whether or not they were lied to about this information or whether or not the intelligence agencies just got it wrong. It's one thing for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence not to be able to pursue that second part of their investigation because of partisan differences. But newspapers and networks don't have that excuse. There was nothing that stopped us or so should what is, have stopped us from doing that. What is your feeling now that the American people were lied to? I don't know. You know what? I don't know. I, okay. I haven't done the reporting. I, I'd I, love to do the reporting. Let but me I, ask this question, which, is, which mm -hmm. interests me from a peculiar point of view, I guess. Mm -hmm. Last week, when you did a Larry King interview, <clears throat> I noticed that when you were talking about Ahmed Chalabi, who was the deputy prime minister of Iraq now and was the head of an, of an Iraqi exile group in London, uh, and I assume was one of your key sources. No, no. Quoted on the record in about in about three or four stories. OK. When I say it's, mm -hmm. why am I asking you this question? Um, you referred to him and Larry King um, two or three times as Dr. Chalabi. Mm -hmm. Now, he does have a PhD from the University of Chicago. I understand that. But that kind of honorific you didn't give to other people you were talking about. On the I don't think Bill Keller is a doctor. No. 
<laughs> who, no, who uh, I mean, if somebody is likes to be referred to in that way, I mean, uh, now is, I would guess I would call him Deputy Prime Minister Chalabi, a consistently underestimated force in Iraq, both in the when he was in the opposition. And now, you may like him, you may dislike him, you may think he's a liar, you may think he's a cheat, but the guy has staying power. I remember when some people from the intelligence community said to me, he was a Savile Row suit. He wouldn't last two minutes in Iraq. Well, you know, he's still there. <laughs> and now he's deputy prime minister. He says he wants to run the country. I think he stands a, sh a chance at it. Uh, he had to be received here. Uh, you know, he's somebody you have to cover no matter what you think of him. And I think the fact that uh, people are kind of dug in on him uh, makes, it, it doesn't help understand who he is and how he operates okay. and his. You went to jail mm -hmm. for 85 days mm -hmm. to protect the identity of a source. That's Louis Libby, now indicted by the, the prosecutor, the <laughs> trial probably coming up next year. Um, I know the principle that you were trying to protect, that you protect a source. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I've, I've always been wondering, um, why did you feel, I understand the principle, but why did you feel the need to protect him? I mean, he's not a, he's a big boy. I mean, he was giving you stuff that he felt was in his interest or the interest of the administration. Unlike every politician in Washington. Unlike every politician in Washington. <laughs> who leaks information because they want you to write something for a political viewpoint. Right. So why did you feel the need to the point of going to jail to protect him? Well, you know, I began to think about that. When do you protect a source? And we debated this believe it or not, at the New York Times quite a bit before I went to jail. And I think I basically came out where Bob Woodward has come out, who supported this decision all the way. One man's uh, whistleblower is another man's snitch. You know, there are good leakers and bad leakers. There are political leakers and people who come to you as underdogs with a sad story. But the challenge for us as journalists is to get them to come to us you know is to you have to encourage a free flow of information by those who have a story to tell of government malfeasance and those who are in government who have a minority viewpoint that may not be expressed from even the powerful who want to tell you how a decision was really made but their bosses don't want you to do it or do want you to do it, but they don't want to take credit for it. You have to balance all of those or different kinds of information. Or they may be telling you things to or mislead they? you. Exactly. So what is the reporter's, you know, what is, what is your mission? Your mission is to get the information out to the American people after you have told, the, told your readers why somebody might be telling you something after you've tried to determine to the best of your ability whether or not it's true, after you've you know, consulted with editors about attribution or how we, you know, how we present this information and, and whether it's page one or D5. And, and it's, uh, you know, that's what, that's what Washington is all about. I it's, understand. it's talk. And, and to the extent that people are impeded from talking, uh, information doesn't get out. Now, I wish that, uh, and here I, I have to be very, I can't discuss Mr. Libby because I might be a witness in this trial, and that's okay. a, a serious uh, constraint on what I can say and not say. But, you know, I wish we'd had a classic whistleblower's case here. But everyone knew from the beginning that, it, that, wasn't that it wasn't. And yet we still made the decision that this was a, quote, good faith source to whom a pledge of confidentiality had been made, and that if we didn't honor that pledge, uh, we would be at fault. Uh, and when you deal with uh, Libby, or with a source like Libby, do you actually literally say, I hereby give you uh, this pledge of confidentiality? Well, or is it assumed? No, it's never, with me, it's, I don't know how other journalists operate, with me it's never assumed. You, you are explicit in your statement. Some, most of the times a senior government official, especially in this administration, will demand it uh, 
or he just or she won't talk to you. Okay, now one thing that I've got to ask you about is this mm -hmm. attribution of Libby as the former Hill mm -hmm. Stafford. Now you've explained again mm -hmm. many times since since you've been out of prison that um, you never intended, it was never in the cards, in fact, that you would ever use that ID. You, you acquired information with the use of that deal that you struck with Libby. And you said that if you were actually going to use the information, then you would go back to him and renegotiate the deal. Or I'd never go back to him at all, and I'd just get someone else to put it on the record. On the record. Or, I mean, there are a lot of different but, ways but of handling sounds, this kind it, of situation. It sounds to any number of people who've been in similar situations that, um, so unnecessary. Why put that extra step into the process? You know, it's, it, I'll tell you why. Because when somebody says, when you're used to identifying someone as a senior administration official, and all of a sudden he starts talking and saying something interesting. And then he says, you know, for the purposes of this part of the conversation, I'd like to be referred to as a former Hill staffer. Kind of sends you a little signal. It sends you a little signal that there's something interesting about to happen here. And you want to know what it is. What's, right. what's sensitive about this? You know, why was this? And once again, I can't go beyond okay. this. I just knew that I wanted to hear it. But the proof is in the pudding. I didn't write a story. Right. I never uh, gave him that kind of an attribution. And in 28 years at the paper, I have never been accused by anyone of misattribution okay. of sources. It just has never happened, because it's too important in terms of being honest with the reader. Okay. You have to tell readers where information is coming from. And yeah, we, we have gotten, uh, you know, I think we as journalists have gotten a little sloppy about that. But I have to say this, Marvin. In the national security world, in intelligence reporting, you're sitting down with people who take polygraphs every three months, every six months. And almost every question begins with, have you spoken to a journalist? That's the, one of the first questions. So you are speaking with people who even the act of speaking with me is something that could get them fired. It's hard to work in an area like that. And you really have to be creative about how you get people to talk. I mean, things have changed so dramatically. I mean, I, my hours changed. I used to call people at their offices. No more. I never called almost anyone in the Bush administration at their offices. It was all at home all meeting them for a cup of coffee outside of the White House or outside of the State Department or outside of, of the DIA because you couldn't be on their log books. You don't exist. We've never had this conversation. These are the normal rules of intelligence and national security reporting. It's the hardest kind of reporting, I think, to do. It's the hardest to get right. It's the trickiest. And yeah, do we make mistakes? Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. But the ones I've been accused of, I think those I didn't make. <laughs> OK. Are you surprised, by the way, that Karl Rove was not indicted? I can't talk about that. I'm sorry. You can't talk about that. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I'm going to be so boring on the subject then, of um, Valerie Plame and Joe Wilson and the entire affair. How do you feel about the prospect of being a witness in a criminal trial? Really, truly terrible. And that's why we need a federal shield law. I was going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> but the really, truly terrible, yes. explain that in a broader context. Go beyond Judy Miller and talk about the idea of reporters now in the environment that you very eloquently described a moment ago, being in a position where they could well be called as witnesses now. Witnesses what does that do the, to report? for the prosecution. It puts us in a very difficult situation. And it was part of the reason that I fought so hard not to reveal a source unless I was totally convinced that this source honestly wanted me to testify. Because I had a, a feeling that this, we all knew. Matt Cooper knew, Tim Russert knew, every journalist, every one of the five of us who cooperated, and we don't know what Bob Novak has done, but uh, you know, everyone who, who cooperated knew that it could end up with our being 
a source, a, a witness in a trial. And that's a, that's a but terrible what is the, thing. Explain to me why that is so terrible. Because journalists in general don't want to be, any more than we want to be the news, we don't want to be an arm of law enforcement. We are citizens, however. And I, once again, I'm probably uh, you know, a maverick here in my profession a little. Uh, but I never believed that journalists, and I still do not believe, that we have an absolute <coughs> privilege, an absolute right to protect sources. There are situations when journalists simply have to cooperate with law enforcement. But do you know that when you're sitting there with a source? You don't know that in the beginning, which is what makes this process so dangerous treacherous. and treacherous. You don't know. I mean, at the, at the when I heard initially I don't think I can talk about this. I, what I can say is that when you're in, a, in an interview, you don't know at the beginning if what you're going to hear is going to wind exactly. up on D25 or not at all, or going to be front page news. You have no idea that, a, that a, a slip of the tongue or a parenthetical remark could become the subject of a special prosecutor's investigation. I mean, this seems so important now. People say, how can she not remember? How can she not remember? I was worried about little things like, was the intelligence slanted? I've just spent three months hunting for WMD in Iraq. Why didn't I find anything? You know, what went wrong? Were we lied to? I was not particularly interested in whether or not somebody went to Niger and apart for to investigate part of a nuclear program, which I wasn't even sure was very serious or worth worrying. It just wasn't important. When I, when I you began. were focused on another aspect of the story. I was focused on the question that I wrote in my front first hand, first person account of my grand jury testimony was the intelligence slanted. That was the first question in my notes to ask Mr. Libby. But now, if there were a federal mm -hmm. shield law, mm -hmm. Would I be, have been covered by it? Would you have been covered, was my question. Well, under the terrific proposal that is now being considered by the Congress, I might very well have been covered. because Would that cover national security it, issues? It exempted from the privilege. And by the way, I don't think it's a reporter's privilege. It's a source's privilege. It's the public's right to know right. protection act. <clears throat> um, but it, the only exemption in the current draft of the legislation is for information that would pose an imminent threat to national security. I don't think that uh, Mr. Fitzgerald could have argued, had there been such a statute, that something in the past would pose an, an imminent, imminent threat, threat to national security. But he might have been able to argue that. I fear we're, we may see this play out in the current uh, investigation or the calls for an investigation into the uh, extraordinarily uh, good story by Dana Priest of the, the Washington, Washington Post, Post about the existence of secret uh, facilities in Eastern Europe. To Explain hold how that might play out. Well, the CIA has already complained to the Justice Department about the unauthorized leak of classified information that it claims puts uh, American assets and intelligence sources and methods at risk. Um, there will be a, an investigation, undoubtedly, I, I fear. And uh, uh, Dana Priest may find herself in the same position that the, the five of us were in uh, with respect to the no, Dana Wilson Priest, investigation. Dana Priest sourced her story by saying U.S. and foreign sources. Yes, she did. So that the Congress or the Department of Justice would be looking into the U.S. officials. Yes. Why uh, do you think the Congress would want to look into the leaking of that information, if that's what it was, to the reporter and not the fact itself about <laughs> CIA-run governed prisons? Excellent, excellent question. It is a sign of the times. You know, it is a sign of, the, the, of our times. Let's, let's beat up on the media. Let's go after the media uh, rather than ask the deeper, more fundamental questions. You know, this notion, I mean, yeah, it's never pleasant to have the stories you got wrong thrown up in your face, but hey, you know, my byline was on those stories. I'm responsible for the fact that they were wrong. I've never dodged that. But you got to ask yourself, isn't the fact that the intelligence may have been just totally flat out wrong, shouldn't that be of greater, uh, of equal concern to the US Congress about 
because if that information was wrong, when all of the resources were focused on Iraq, what do we really know about Iran or about Syria or about Al Qaeda and their efforts in, to a, a to acquire WMD. I mean, it raises the most profound questions about how safe we are, and yet you can't seem to get much journalistic or congressional interest in, in that broad, essential failure of intelligence, which I just find worry, worrying every day. I mean, I live in New York. You know, New York's a prime target. You guys are here in Washington, prime target number two. LA, prime target number three. I mean, people should be worried about the kinds of spy craft that we saw uh, it, finally written about in these extraordinary reports that have been done that nobody's read. I mean, read the Rob Silberman report on, on, on intelligence and WMD. It'll make your hair stand on end. And yet you can't get a debate going about that. It's much easier to say, oh, you know, these stories were wrong. We were lied our way into a war. I really believe, Marvin, George Bush would have gone to war without Judy Miller and without the Judy Miller stories. And he would have gone to, to war without the New York Times endorsing the war and other newspapers throughout the country. Um, Why? Because he wanted to go to war in Iraq. Because, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty clear. We don't know. We still don't know. We've read Bob Woodward's excellent book. We've read a lot of different interpretations. But, you know, I, the administration says, after 9-11, were we willing to take the chance that Saddam still had this stuff and that it could wind up transported to our shores? There is the slight possibility, which half of America won't give this administration credit, any credit for, there's a slight possibility that they really did see Iraq as a kind of threat to American allies and to the United States. But until we have that investigation, an independent investigation into those kinds of questions, I'm not sure we're going to know the answer. Judy, you've only got a little more than a minute. Um, you sound to me like a columnist. You sound to me like somebody <laughs> oh, God. Who, is never, who is never again going to be a reporter, someone who feels the need to say what it is that she thinks about the major issues facing this country. Am I right? Well, I always thought I could do that through, um, through the subjects I chose to write about. You know, I, I, I worried about anthrax before it was the threat that it became. I worried about WMD and terror attacks before we began to see signs of al-Qaeda uh, collecting and trying to pay people to do this. But now, you're, I guess you're right. You know, I think part of, the time, part of the reason I decided to leave the Times was that after a while, after 28 years, you think maybe you do want to be a little bit more open about your, your views and your passions. And, and if I were to ever write a column, and I really, honest to goodness, Marvin, haven't decided what I want to do, but if I were ever to write a column, I would hope that it would be a reported column. Because nobody, nobody's interested in what you know Judy Miller or any other columnist has to say, I think, unless it's A, extremely well written, or B, and or hopefully um, contains new information and something that, well, that makes them pay attention. So I would hope that a reported column, if were I ever to do one, would be the way I would go. Well, I would hope so. And <laughs> I want to believe that your time in prison will serve as a reminder <laughs> <hope> so. <laughs> of the sacrifice that some journalists will make to protect the identity of a source. And so long as journalists depend on unnamed sources, and many do, as you've said, in covering national security issues, protecting a source is still a sacred responsibility for some of those reporters. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the National Press Club, the George Washington University and the Shorenstein Center on the Press Politics and Public Policy at Harvard. I also want to thank the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. Most important, I want to thank the fearless Judy Miller for being our guest on the Calp Report. Thank you. Good night and good luck.